So basically, you're creating fire breaks and reducing fuel loads throughout the fire prone sector while also harvesting yields and creating healthy ecosystems. And that's the permaculture way. So I live here on the west coast of the United States, and let me tell you, the fires have been feeling pretty apocalyptic in recent years. The climate is changing, and fire season has expanded. Summers are longer, hotter, and drier than they have been, with strong wind events that have added up to explosive wildfire conditions. The smoke has gotten crazy, and fire disasters have become a new normal that we're living with. So whether you're in Australia, Southern Europe, Siberia, or anywhere else that's been burning up, we need to understand and prepare to survive this new normal. And permaculture design has a lot of helpful design strategies to make us more resilient to wildfire danger. So there's two important pieces to designing for wildfire defense. Because before you can actually design your defensive landscape, you need to understand the most likely direction that wildfire will travel towards you from. Now, under normal fire conditions, there are three main influences on the direction and severity of a fire, and those are slope, wind, and fuel. So this is all pretty common sense. Heat rises, so fire will travel up slope and preheat the air and vegetation ahead of it as it burns. And fire is carried and fanned by the wind. And the intensity of the fire will be determined by the type and amount of fuels present. So if there's dense and flammable vegetation, then there are also fire ladders, where the fire can easily jump from grasses to shrubs to low tree limbs and up into the tree canopies. Then you've got a problem, because when slope, wind, and fuel are all aligned, then a fire has lots of energy for fast and fatal movement. In any landscape, there'll be the typical prevailing wind direction during the fire season. In most of the western United States, south and west winds are common during the summer and fall fire seasons. So these south and west facing slopes will be more dehydrated and will be able to carry fire earlier on in the season than these wetter and cooler northeast slopes. But just because the wind comes from the southwest, for example, doesn't mean that a fire can't burn up a north slope. A fire can burn up any one of these slopes because under normal fire conditions, slope trumps wind, meaning that slope and fuel are actually the dominant forces in determining wildfire danger. So are you noticing something about this house location here? When you're on the top of a hill or ridge, then fire can burn up to you from any direction. So in a fire prone landscape, this is just a bad place to put a house or neighborhood. Under normal fire conditions, we talked about how slope trumps wind and fire burns up slope as a rule. But when we have extreme fire conditions, it means that we introduce very strong winds into the equation. And when very strong, sometimes hurricane force winds are blowing, then they can actually push fires down slope with catastrophic results. Let's look at where I live, in Northwest Oregon's Willamette Valley, for example. Here's my interpretation of the Willamette Valley. See, here we have the coastal mountains right here, and then we have the Willamette Valley in here, and then we have the Cascade Mountain Range right here. Now, mostly during summer, we have south and westerly winds. The coastal mountains facing the ocean are very wet, so not a lot of fires start over here. Now you can get strong winds from the west and the south during fire season with the Cascade Mountains sloping up in the same direction as the prevailing winds. And so most of the likely direction of fire is up these mountains. We have slope and wind direction aligned all on heavily forested land here. But in the summer of 2020, during the Labor Day fires, the winds changed direction at the wrong time and a very severe hot dry wind came from the continent's interior and blew with hurricane force gusts over the Cascade Mountains and acted like a blowtorch to funnel crazy strong winds down all these canyons and valleys. 
So suddenly, wind took over as the dominant force, and the destruction was catastrophic. Whole towns burned down, and irreplaceable natural areas were destroyed. Even the wetter coastal mountain range was not immune, and a wildfire burned down slope almost to the ocean. Some say these winds were just a historic anomaly, and others say the jet stream has been thrown out of whack by the warming of the planet, and we can expect this kind of rare wind event more regularly. Either way, I'm playing it safe and considering that this could happen again in any year. It's the same situation in California, when hot and dry continental winds have crested the Sierra Nevada mountains and blown down electric power lines, which have sparked fires across the region. This is an all new level of destruction than we've previously experienced, added to by the fact that houses and towns have spread far up into forested and highly flammable areas. So really, before we even get into permaculture design for wildfire defense, you need to ask yourself if your location is even survivable in the event of a megafire, because the scale of what I'm showing you here in many cases is beyond what you can mitigate on a single property. At this point, there are a lot of homes, developments, and towns that are just poorly placed within the macro landscape, and I'd encourage you to take a hard and sober look at your location, because these megafires are no joke. So we've talked about assessment. Now let's talk about design. All right, so we're gonna talk about design now. Figuring out the likely direction and intensity of a wildfire is the first step. Now, as we saw in the first part of this presentation, sloped and forested areas are more at risk for wildfire. So let's start there. So in the event that a fire is coming, it's more than likely that the power grid will go down in your area and you won't have the use of electricity unless you're off the grid. So it's really smart to have a reservoir that's kept full of water throughout the dry season. Now, of course, a large water tank will do as well. If you want a whole bunch of details about permaculture pond design, please see my previous video, Permaculture Ponds, Why, Where, and How, linked above and also in the video description. Now, this drawing is diagrammatic, so don't actually place the pond directly above the house where if there was a breach, it would flood the building. But you want to place it elevationally above the house and high enough above that you can pressurize sprinklers on the roof and around the home. And also where you can have a valve that you can open and flood some sort of perimeter basin or swale around the home. So the most important thing is that this is all non-electric or using off-grid electricity and set up in a way where you can deliver a high volume of water and wet the home area quickly. So that's why having the pond at some elevation above the structure is so important. Now how you fill that pond or tank and keep it full is gonna depend on your particular site. And you can watch some of my other videos or take a permaculture design course to get an idea of that. Now directly around the home, you don't want any flammable vegetation and you don't wanna have fire ladders where fire can travel up from the ground level into the canopies of trees. So having more luscious big leaf trees for shade and food production are appropriate. Now, around the house itself, in the direction that a likely fire is gonna come from, you want things that really will not burn, like patios, vegetable gardens. So you also wanna exclude things that will burn from around your house, like wood piles, wood fencing, and fuel storage. And then you basically wanna place non-flammable design elements in the direction of a likely fire, like irrigated orchards roads, driveways, and parking areas, wastewater treatment areas. So do you play volleyball, have a croquet lawn, flower garden, seed drying or winnowing area? Just place everything that could serve as a fire break between your structures and the likely direction of a fire. It's that simple. And from the permaculture perspective, this means positioning your zone one highly managed elements within your fire sector. And then you've got to consider that in a fire, it's not just the flames itself coming towards you, but it could be embers whirling and blowing in the wind in a kind of a storm. So the design of the house needs to consider surviving an ember storm. Now there are a lot of resources out there for the architectural design of a house that's resistant to wildfire. So I'm not going to cover that in this video. Just search 
wildfire resistant homes and you'll be all set. You'll have to consider the intense heat and blowing embers that precede a fire's arrival and make sure that your house can withstand that without igniting. So out from the home area, we have a different set of treatments in the wider landscape. So this is the same home and this broader area that's in the likely direction of a wildfire is where we'll look at now. Let's look at ways that we can break the movement of a fire and reduce the fuel load in the wider landscape. First off, like we mentioned previously, thinning out vegetation and removing fire ladders is one way to stop a fire from going up into the canopies of trees. But what do you do with all those prunings? There are a few options. One is to build a culture mound. A culture is essentially just a mound of wood buried by soil, where the wood is piled up along the contour and soil excavated out to bury the wood and create a big long mound. Now, because this mound has a core of wood, over time it will break down and become a big sponge for water. So there should be conditions to grow more luscious and less flammable plant species. Placing it along the contour means that it will serve as a water slowing structure in the landscape and soak up extra rainwater when it rains. But it can also be grazed by goats or sheep to keep down grasses during the fire season. In fact, you can rotate animals through all these areas as another method of keeping the fuel load down and breaking the fire ladders. And you can include fencing. Maybe you can even fit another pond in between your home and the likely direction of a fire. And if you have enough water to release below for flooding other areas during a fire, then that's even more ideal. Another method of fuel reduction is to do your own burning during the cooler rainy season when the forest or shrubland is thinned and then turn the prunings into biochar using a special biochar kiln. So biochar is a kind of charcoal that is used as a soil amendment. So you're basically taking your prunings and burning them in a special kiln that excludes oxygen during the burning process, which turns the wood into a soil amendment that can then be deposited on the forest floor to improve the soil's health and water holding capacity. Spongy healthy soil will also help to reduce the risk of fire by holding more moisture in the system for longer time. So basically, you're creating fire breaks and reducing fuel loads throughout the fire prone sector while also harvesting yields and creating healthy ecosystems. And that's the permaculture way. But there are a couple more important things to mention, especially if you live in a more remote rural area. The first is to have an evacuation route planned into your overall design site that's away from the likely direction of fire. And the last resort is to have some sort of bunker where you can go underground and wait out the fire. All right, so let me know in the comments if you have more ideas because this fire situation is with us now and we need to innovate more than ever to respond to this new normal. Good luck out there, folks, and stay safe.